Owens Valley is at the western edge of the Great Basin Desert. It's a deep trough formed by the Sierra Nevada on the west and the Wyden Inyo Ranges on the east. Because of its desert climate, the first Euro-American settlers who arrived in Owens Valley in the 1850s were amazed at the extensive meadows, which covered thousands of hectares. Meadows were sustained by shallow groundwater and in places enhanced by networks of irrigation ditches dug by Native Americans. The shallow groundwater arose from snowmelt percolating down from the Sierra Nevada. In the 1860s, the Euro-American settlers called in the U.S. cavalry to forcibly subdue Native Americans and take over their lands and irrigation ditches. In the 1920s, having used controversial means to acquire land and water rights, the city of Los Angeles called in armed detectives to forcibly subdue the settlers' descendants and take over their land and irrigation ditches. Los Angeles also built its own ditch, now known as the Los Angeles Aqueduct. It currently supplies from one to two-thirds of the drinking water for the entire city. In 1970, Los Angeles enlarged its aqueduct by over 50 percent. To help fill the enlarged capacity, it greatly increased Owens Valley groundwater pumping, which caused dramatic impacts. Inyo County sued under the California Environmental Quality Act, and this litigation in various forms continued for 19 years until it was settled with the signing in 1991 of the Inyo LA Long-Term Water Agreement. We will present a case study in management under this agreement. The details of the water agreement are numerous, complicated, and confusing, but the underlying concepts are not. The goal is to avoid certain described changes and other significant impacts to the Owens Valley environment while providing a reliable water supply to Los Angeles. In other words, sustainable management. How could this possibly be achieved? First, by lowering expectations. The changes and impacts that were to be avoided would be measured relative to conditions documented by Los Angeles in the mid-1980s after massive pumping had been going on for over 14 years. Neither party had any illusions that they were trying to maintain pristine conditions. Impacts would be avoided by exploiting the drought hardiness of well-field vegetation. It was thought dominant species could tolerate one to several year cycles of drawdown and recovery. In other words, ecosystems would be subject to managed groundwater drought. The drought recovery policy was also added as an insurance policy. Los Angeles had pumped record volumes of water during the unmanaged climatic drought of the late 1980s while the water agreement was being negotiated and created enormous drawdowns. The drought recovery policy explicitly called for recovery of soil moisture to vegetation rooting zones and was a further constraint on pumping beyond the water agreement's basic protocol. Our study area is in central Owens Valley. It consists of two parcels of homogeneous vegetation outlined in green on the right. The parcels were circumscribed and inventoried for species, composition, and cover by Los Angeles in 1986. The cover and composition data define baseline conditions and management goals for the water agreement. Both parcels were dominated by the grasses Sporobolus aroides and Disticlus spicata, and the southern parcel had higher cover than the northern one. Here, parcel boundaries are superimposed on a 1912 map by Los Angeles' consulting engineer Charles Lee. The tan diagonal hatch marks in Lee's map indicate meadow vegetation, part of a much larger area. Vegetation to the west of the meadow is dominated by shrubs. Lee observed that the grass shrub ecotone was very close to the 8-foot depth to water contour. He commented on the striking correlation between vegetation and depth to water and observed that the meadow zone occurred in areas where average depth to water was no deeper than 8 feet. Lee not only mapped vegetation and depth to water in space, he also documented changes in time. This hydrograph shows depth to water at two test wells over a three-year period. The top line represents the ground surface. Units on the vertical axis represent feet, and on the horizontal axis, months. Each spring, as the growing season starts, plants and sunshine suck water out of the ground through the process of evapotranspiration, lowering the water table several feet. Each autumn, as the growing season ends, evapotranspiration slows and water tables are recharged. The regular pattern in the hydrograph is characteristic of the meadow zone. Under the water agreement, annual cycles of drawdown and recovery driven by evapotranspiration would be replaced by one to several year cycles driven by groundwater pumping or managed groundwater drought. Here are some actual hydrographs from the study area. Units on the vertical axes are in meters instead of feet, and units on the horizontal axes are in years instead of months. The bottom hydrograph shows the test well at TS3 just outside the southern parcel. It shows two cycles of drawdown and recovery. This hydrograph is typical of wells in the southern parcel. The top graph shows hydrographs from test wells at monitoring sites TS1 and TS2 in the northern parcel. Both wells show deep drawdowns from pumping during the late 1980s drought. 
Recovery to the grass rooting zone, about two meters for native groundwater dependent species, has yet to occur. Hydrographs of these two wells are typical of wells in the northern parcel. Management of these parcels constitutes an unplanned experiment testing the water agreement's conceptual model. The southern parcel was managed in compliance with this model of cycles of drawdown and recovery, while the northern parcel was not. We can also see this unplanned experiment from a top-down view. The 8-foot depth to water contour which Lee associated with the grass shrub interface is highlighted in blue on the map at the left. In the air photo at right, the 1912 location of the 8-foot contour has been mapped along with its location in 1986 and 1990. It migrated at least a kilometer to the southeast between 1986 and 1990 and has never returned to its original position. It simply fluctuated around its 1990 position. That means the northern parcel has been continuously managed in a way that ought to favor shrubs over grasses according to Lee's model. The southern parcel, on the other hand, has been managed in compliance with the conceptual model of the water agreement. This image shows results of spectral mixture analysis of Landsat data. The data were provided by Andrew Elmore of the University of Maryland. Estimated live cover declined from 47% to 19% in the non-compliant parcel between 1986 and 2006. This was a relative decline of over 50%. In the compliant parcel, estimated live cover only declined from 58% to 51% during the same period. These graphs show the ratio of grass cover to shrub cover over time. A value of 1 means all grass and no shrubs, while a value of 0 means all shrubs and no grass. In the top graph, the green line represents permanent monitoring site TS3 in the compliant area shown on the bottom of the map. It shows a slight decline. The red and orange lines represent permanent monitoring sites TS1 and TS2 in the non-compliant parcel. They show dramatic declines, indicating shrubs have become dominant. The bottom graph shows the average grass-shrub ratio for each parcel for each year. 12 to 26 transects are randomly placed and read each year in each parcel to calculate these averages. The green line represents the average for the compliant parcel. There is no significant trend over time. The red line represents the average for the entire non-compliant parcel. There is a significant downward trend indicating increasing shrub dominance. The trends at both spatial scales, permanent monitoring sites and entire parcels, are similar. The non-compliant monitoring sites and parcels show rapid conversion to shrub dominance, while the compliant monitoring site and parcel do not. Some of the underlying processes can be seen by examination of grass cover at permanent monitoring sites. This graph shows TS3 in the compliant area from 1988 through 2007. Grass cover bounces up and down, but shows no obvious trend. The site is buffered by relatively shallow groundwater. Grass cover at permanent monitoring site TS2 in the non-compliant area looks quite different. It shows a significant downward trend over time. The water table has been drawn down continuously since 1989. The downward trend in grass cover represents the loss of the buffering effect of shallow groundwater. Here we have added precipitation to the graph of grass cover in the previous slide. Grass cover is equilibrating with precipitation without buffering by shallow groundwater. Because average precipitation is only about 11 centimeters a year, management goals for grass cover cannot possibly be met.